Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. So everything looks good. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth annual Native Plant Symposium. Uh, thank you all so much for being here on such a beautiful day. Uh, so my name is Jessica McCauley with the Prince William Soil and Water Conservation District, and I will be moderating this presentation today. So I'm excited to introduce Nancy Berlin, who will be presenting Meadows. In this presentation, you'll learn about how to create and maintain a beautiful, colorful yard to support wildlife and native flowers. When Nancy is not working in her meadow, she enjoys her work with the Virginia Cooperative Extension. Since 2007, she has served as the Natural Resource Specialist and Coordinator of the Master Gardener Program, serving Prince William County, Manassas City, and Manassas Park. She studied natural resources at Virginia Tech's graduate program. The Prince William Master Gardener Program has over 200 active, highly trained volunteers who serve as environmental educators, teaching our community sustainable landscaping, savvy lawn care, effective and research-based pest management as a last alternative, as well as wildlife and water quality programs. Staff and volunteers in the Master Gardener Program have been involved in the launching of many community gardens and other collaborative projects. At the end of the presentation, we will have a 10 minute Q&A in the chat box. You can type your questions there at any time and then I will relay them to Nancy at the end. Um, and here is Nancy Berlin presenting Meadows. Well, it's great to have you here. And um, uh, Matt's uh, presentation will segue well into mine. Um, so thank you, Jess. I'm gonna try to advance my slides. So we're gonna define a meadow. This is a picture of some of the chaos in my front yard. <laughs> but to a biologist, a meadow is a grassland where plants are allowed to grow and set seed in the spring and summer. It's not a grazing area. But to a farmer, a meadow was traditionally a grassland that was mown to make hay um, and stored for livestock. But for most people and for our purposes today, we're going to call it a flat or sloping um, lowland, uh, a, gra a grassland, um, oops, excuse me. And um, you'll, you'll note that it does say grassland, a natural meadow has uh, predominantly grasses and that may not be um, a, a consistent um, condition. Let's see, there we go. This is a meadow at Chanticleer, it's not entirely native. Um, and it's not uh, predominantly grasses, um, but a, a natural meadow does evolve into about 50 to 70 percent native grasses or sedges. There's generally no woody vegetation, although my meadow has a, a, a shrub coming up because I'm getting old and it's hard to uh, maintain everything with uh, herbaceous stuff. It has diverse plant groups, as Matt talked about, uh, um, and, and varied bloom times and uh, provides habitat and ecological value. So there are some myths that are floating around for meadows and that it's easy to have a colorful flower filled meadow spring through fall. Um, you know, if you work in a garden center, um, people will come in and say, well, what's gonna bloom all summer long? And there's, there's no plant that will, that will achieve that. And, and getting a meadow, uh, meadows change daily. Um, and that's what the beauty of a meadow is to go out and see what's new and what has come up on its own spontaneously. Uh, it's also meadows require little to no maintenance. That's a myth, um, um, especially getting it started. Um, uh, you know, certainly some maintenance is needed. And there's a myth that you can just buy one of those um, uh, meadows in a in a can and and scatter it and around and make just make a meadow and most of those um, meadow in a can are annuals they're not usually natives so there are some challenges to establishing a meadow and I probably have hit them all and that's probably why 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 I um, am going to urge some caution there's a lot of poor instructions about how to create a meadow. And there's sometimes a shortage of local natives, although Earth Sangha is a fantastic resource for us. Um, you have to have a certain amount of persistence to deal with invasives coming in and making sure that bare spots get covered. Um, so uh, they're not 
weeds aren't able to move in. And sometimes people have unrealistic expectations about what, you know, what a meadow is. And so we're going to try to challenge those things today. Why would you want to establish a meadow? Well, I did it when my um, youngest went away to college and I decided I didn't want to mow. So I was going to convert a lot of my turf area um, that was difficult to mow. Uh, and I wanted to eliminate mowing entirely in my backyard. And I've successfully done that. I weed whack one little path. Um, it provides habitat for beneficial insects and wildlife, as you know from Matt's talk. Um, the, my favorite thing to do is to go out every day and see what's going on. And, and there's, there's adventures and drama going on in the meadow every day. Um, it supplies seeds, cover, and nesting material for birds, as you know. It, and it provides an example of stewardship. So it's probably twice a week someone will drive by my house and I have a front yard meadow and a backyard meadow and they'll make some comment and sometimes they'll pull over and I'll give them some seeds to take home or I've even dug up plants, but it, it's a way to set an example in your neighborhood of something besides the well curated lawn with the neat and tidy planting beds. Um, and most of the comments have been positive. I'm pretty sure that there's some people that think I'm a little crazy, but it, it does a great job absorbing stormwater and reducing erosion. Last week when we had that really, really uh, intense rainstorm, my, my front yard is very flat and um, it, a lot of water collected there. And I had a contractor come by and um, he, he said, oh, look at all that flooding, but within an hour, all these native plants had soaked in that stormwater. There's no need to use fertilizer and pesticides, and it's a great way to learn about the natural world right in your own yard. So here's, I have a very modest house. This is a drone picture um, from many years ago, but um, you can see I have some paths in there. Um, and uh, but and it, that was not as densely pl planted as it is now. Uh, on the left um, is the first year I did it. That there are a lot of annuals that are not native in there. There's some sweet william and some bachelor's buttons. I am not a complete purist. I'll put some annuals in there that are not natives, but all the ones I'm going to be talking about today and focusing on will be uh, local ecotypes. So there's benefits to a meadow, the ecosystem services that it provides, certainly. Um, again, meadows are great for stormwater. Here's a, here's a meadow at... Um, um, wolf trap. And, you, and here's a, a little area that I've um, put some plants in here uh, to deal with the problem area in my yard. Um, that particular, particular picture does not show natives, but you get the idea of dense planting helping with this slope here. And, you know, we, I think we could call this a mini meadow or, or a vegetated swale or conservation landscaping, but this, um, this um, hell strip here could be uh, considered a, a small meadow and can do the same thing for stormwater. So Doug Talmy says that when gardeners use native plants, they can have beautiful landscapes and your yard pro plays a vital role in protecting biodiversity. <clears throat> This is a, a sort of a new program um, with um, uh, hometown habitat. Um, in the past, we've only asked that plants be pretty and gardens be pretty, but now we're expecting them to support life, feed pollinators and other beneficial insects, sequester carbon and manage water. And so this, this uh, hometown habitat and, and homegrown national park um, initiative with Doug Tallamy is a great way to do it. And you can get your property listed on his map here. We're, we're getting ready to put our teaching garden in Bristow on this map. So you can Google Homegrown National Park to find out more about that. So comparing a meadow and a turf, and you know, I don't, I probably don't have to convince this group that uh, turf is a very high maintenance crop. And some people really want turf. And so if we, for those clients, we recommend they reduce the size of the turf and manage it appropriately. Turf requires fertilization um, annually in the fall and it, and it requires mowing. It, it often will require some, some herbicide if you want a, 
a, a lawn that looks like a golf course. But of course, that's not what we're here for. A meadow, you can mow it annually. Uh, um, there's no irrigation needed except when you're establishing a new plant, no fertilizers or pesticides are needed. And there is some weed control needed. I, I am out there um, getting some winter weeds up almost every day this week. So let's talk about site assessment um, and think about, you know, picture your site um, in what kind of soil uh, and draw a diagram. Uh, what kind of wildlife are you dealing with? These are just a few things to think about before you jump in. Is it adjacent to another habitat um, that, that you can link it to? Uh, keep it out of the right of way on the property. We had a client that had some native plants mowed down by a utility company this week because it was on the edge of the right of way. So we'd want to avoid that. What kind of sun exposure have you got? Are there plants and or, or woodies uh, present? Is it on a slope? And that's going to really um, help you to think through uh, what you're dealing with, whether it's wet or dry conditions, or, or are you dealing with some tree roots adjacent in an adjacent area? So, um, and what kind of function do you want it to, to um, fulfill? Uh, I like it because for all of these reasons, um, and here you see, uh, uh, so, so, some lady beetles. Now these are Asian lead, lady beetles, but they're doing the job in my yard. And, and there's all, all three stages. The larva eat, eat aphids. There's the pupa in the bottom right. And there you see two ladybugs um, making more ladybugs. So this is my backyard. And right, uh, the, the big tree in the background on the left has a um, is a black walnut and there's a, a meadow under that that um, has established quite nicely over the years. But you use the snowstorm tomorrow to look at your uh, topography. Uh, the last place that snow is going to melt is the coolest and probably the least sunny. And, right. and sure. you can uh, determine what plants you need to to put in in those places based on those topography. Watch after the spring rains for low spots uh, for placement of plants that like wet feet. There's cardinal flower at the bottom right. I haven't been highly successful at getting car cardinal flower to return reliably, but it's a plant that really likes wet feet. So I would, my suggestion is to start small and you can even make a pocket meadow. You can start with a 10 by 10 small area and um, then you can enlarge it as you um, have time and resources. Consider a, uh, adjoining it to a wildlife pathway uh, or other habitat. Um, so I'm going to show you some ways to um, prepare the soil ahead of time or let it spontaneously generate uh, plants that are already in the seed bank in the soil. Native plants prefer just normal soil. Matt, Matt has given us excellent recommendations for a bunch of um, meadows that we've done at schools and we, we haven't really modified the soil other to, to break up the clay a little bit and um, make it more um, able to handle water. Um, develop your plan to remove weeds and grasses from the edges that will keep going in. Yesterday I was at a meadow at Belmont Bay and we were um, removing a lot of foxtail head, seed heads to make sure that they didn't reseed in there. Um, you can order plugs, plants, or seeds, and more on that later, and decide whether you want deer-resistant plants. And, and um, in my backyard, I have a lot of deer pressure. In fact, I'm providing such good nutrition in my yard that I had triplets born in my front yard last year. Um, and so uh, I do uh, do a few, I, I pick my plants carefully. I'm not going to spend money on plants that are going to get eaten um, because uh, triplets are a lot to deal with. <laughs> so um, be sure to include some native grasses. And so I've read anywhere from 20% to 70% native grasses. I probably have about 30% in my yard. Uh, and I have those in areas that are high erosion potential because those native plant land of grasses have great roots to hold that soil. Uh, uh, I water new plants weekly. And plugs are a little closer, and I'll show you some pictures of what a plug look like. If you're seeding, consult a good, reputable seed company that has local ecotypes. And there are a couple in the in my resources at the end. 
Um, and you just need to choose, choose your species carefully with seeding. There are only a couple that have, um, you know, uh, mid-Atlantic East Coast species. And, and really getting plants from uh, local ecotypes from Ursanga is probably a better idea. Most seeds uh, can be scratched into shallow soil. We don't want to till to bring up all the weed seeds, but you have to have really good packed down soil to make sure you're not wasting your money on these seeds. Learn what the seedlings look like. Uh, at, a, at a school garden, we had the kids put in the seeds in uh, containers so that they could watch to see what the seedlings look like and learn how to, how to identify them. So that when we were actually doing some weeding that they, they could compare that and make sure they didn't, weren't pulling up the wrong thing. You don't have to mulch or fertilize. So if you're in an HOA, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you know, you can have a nice meadow, even if you're in an HOA, but it has to be quite quite a bit tidier. So um, I'm working with a couple HOAs to put in some some um, small meadows adjacent to a, a stormwater pond. Get to know your neighbors and um, tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it. The Master Gardener Program in Prince William County, Manassas City and Manassas Park has an Audubon at Home Program and we can visit your yard and give recommendations. We're not there to judge your landscape. We're there to give some recommendations for native plants that you could put in, ways that you can improve the habitat in your own landscape. You can also contact the Watershed Branch of Environmental Services in Prince William and get your yard on a list. So if there are any complaints, um, the county is aware of your landscape plan. And so um, we'll give you resources for that. But be prepared with an elevator speech. You know, when somebody drives by, oh, your, your yard is so wild and crazy and pretty. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So here's Verona Castor in my front yard meadow. And it reminds me of a ballet dancer. I, I, um, I love this plant. But let's talk a little bit about site preparation. So. Um, this is an allium, a uh, native allium from Ursanga. Um, you need to spend time on site preparation. It's going to pay off in subsequent years and it's going to reduce, reduce your um, need for upkeep. But we want to minimize any soil disturbance to keep weed seeds um, under the soil in the dark. And they, because those weed seeds are going to always be there, they'll lie dormant for years, but there's also seeds of native plants that would like to come up given the right opportunity. The less soil disturbance, the better to maintain that structure of the soil. And there's, as Matt was talking about, there's fungal and bacterial communities, and we don't want to disturb those. That's like breaking up a home. And we want to, um, it, we also can retain organic matter much better. So here, there's some op different options for uh, bare soil meadow establishment and seeding is one. And if you're gonna seed, bare soil is probably your best option, um, but, but you, have to have, um, you have to have a plan and you have to be able to act kind of quickly. Uh, you can remove existing vegetation or kill it. Um, you can prep the soil, um, put in a cover crop. So if I'm gonna establish a new meadow area in my backyard, I might put in uh, these non-natives, but they, they hold the soil over the winter, crimson clover, hairy vetch, and in summer buckwheat. And, and those keep the, those roots hold the soil and provide uh, nitrogen in the soil. And then I, I crimp them over um, and then I can plant in there without having a lot of competition from weeds. The cover crop doesn't stay, they're all annuals. They don't reseed crazy. Uh, and so that they are a good solution. This morning, I, I had a few bare areas in my soil out front in my yard and I put some crimson clover down so that it would um, be able to uh, hold those spaces for another plant in the, in the spring. If the area is turf, you can use a side cutter um, to remove that the turf stolons or rhizomes. Again, keeping trying to minimize the soil disturbance below that though. And if, if your area is in managed turf now, uh, you're probably putting lime and fertilizer in. It would be best to, to try to get a soil test from your extension office to make sure that um, 
you know, it hasn't been over fertilized. You just want to know what you're working with. So that's a good idea if you're converting managed turf uh, to a meadow. And the area can be scalped or mowed very low. Uh, again, avoid tilling. The timing of the seed seeding depends on the type of seed. Some seeds need that uh, freeze and thaw period in order to germinate well. So non-selective herbicide can be used, but and it's best with young plants. Um, but um, there, I have some better alternatives. So remove the excess vegetation, especially anything with seeds in it. This is a Benedictine monastery. Uh, we're establishing a meadow there. Um, two master gardeners are working with the monastery on this. It's adjacent to our teaching garden. And um, so we're following some advice from Bob Glennon with the USDA on uh, species to put here. And they're all gonna be, be local ecotypes. We're gonna be seeding and using some plugs. So they pre started preparing this site last fall and it's about ready to be uh, planted soon. This is, a, this is a meadow at the Eagle Center and uh, it was funded with a plant grant from uh, Ursanga. And uh, the plan was for teachers to go and weed it periodically during the summer. And we planted it last May. But when teachers got caught away with COVID um, to the classrooms, our volunteers jumped in. And so we're, we're working to, um, to uh, tag the plants, make sure there's nothing uh, invasive growing next to it and wait and see what it's. We were out there yesterday and it's looking pretty good, but um, it, some maintenance is definitely needed. So if you're working with existing vegetation, this is what Matt was, Bright was talking about. It's possible to allow a meadow of existing plant communities to naturally emerge and develop, but this does require some attention and um, you know, monitoring for, with persistence. Um, you could add plants or remove them as the meadow evolves and as you have time and a budget, and some natives are more aggressive, and um, and you can edit them out as you as as the meadow becomes more um, more profuse. So the, um, another picture I have echinacea here. That's the only thing I have. Um, well, what's that's one of the few nat uh, non natives that I have in here, but um, this picture shows Verona castrum and some uh, there's some uh, New York ironweed and. Uh, yarrow, um, but non-chemical does require advanced planning. It requires longer duration, some patience, persistence. So those are all good character traits for gardeners. And you can remove the dead vegetation without with minimal disturbance. All right, sometimes we just cut the weeds right off at the surface. <clears throat> so solarizing is one non-chemical technique, and I've used both of both all these techniques. Um, you can use clear plastic and I would get a thick enough clear plastic that you can reuse so that we're not contributing and you cover the area and uh, uh, bury the edges either under the soil or with landscape uh, staples and leave it in place for during the hot hottest part of the summer for about four to six weeks and then you remove the plastic and I, I did some raking of the plant debris um, under that. Uh, occupation is similar, only it's using a black, uh, and this is uh, this is reusable uh, landscape fabric that, like, is used in agriculture. Uh, the weed barrier is pinned down over a, a bed filled with winter annuals, let's say right now, and it was ready to plant about two to four weeks. Uh, and it, so you're covering the soil. And um, when I took up the soil, I just gently raked uh, the plant debris that was left. Um, and composted it. And then I, um, there were a lot of baby snakes under there. They're liking that warm habitat during the winter. Chip drop is another option uh, to cover an area with wood chips. Uh, you can read more about this with the garden professors. Um, and uh, this is free. I have about an eight foot pile in my front yard now. I, I only use it to create paths or to cover a bare area until I can get it planted. Uh, you can also call um, a local arborist and they have to pay to take these to a landfill. So um, they're usually happy to drop them off, but you can't get a small amount usually. 
So plant selection, this is Zizia with some action going on on there. And, um, and this, this is gonna be a repeat of Matt, Matt what, what Matt was talking about, but in Prince William County, we have natural boundaries, but we are also Piedmont conditions and we have coastal plain conditions. About 80% of the county is in the Piedmont region. It's a transition area between Northern and some Southern Piedmonts. So Prince William is divided into two physiographic regions again, and there's a transition zone in between. And, and the I-95 corridor roughly follows and divides those two regions. So picking plants according to a reference area is really important. Plant communities, as Matt talked about, are affected by hydrology, geology, what soil type, and the topography that the geology creates. So geology creates the soils and that, that tells us about the vegetation type. So what plants can you, can you see in nearby natural areas? I have a floodplain behind me that's wooded and it's a riparian area. So I kind of skirt um, a couple different plant communities. So you can use like a, nat a park that's nearby, a more natural area to see what kind of um, plant community you might have. So this is a repeat of Matt's, but uh, these are three common reference communities um, that you might have. And, and you, what you do is you're looking for what is already growing in that reference community nearby so that you could make better um, choices about what you're going to plant. So mine, mine is a Piedmont mountain floodplain and a basic music forest. So those are the things that grow in those among many others. But this will just give you a new way to make plant decisions instead of, you know, maybe what what looks good at the garden at, at the garden center or, or, or sangha for for selection. So these plants like to grow together. They're they're dependent on the soil and the geography. So for initial plant selection, it can be overwhelming. So start with that reference list, and you can go to the DCR. Um, natural heritage and, and look at the descriptions that Matt gave you of the uh, reference communities and the plant communities that are common in the Piedmont or the coastal plain, depending on where you live. Determine what your budget is. Uh, seeding is probably the cheapest, although it's not cheap. Um, plugs are probably the le uh, less expensive than plants, um, but and I'll show you some pictures of those. So. I would say to start small, pick three to five species and a small area to convert. You're gonna plant in drifts um, instead of individual plants. And, and they like to be close together. Many plants will grow right on top of each other. And if you pick plants that are in the right natural community, they will, they will um, work really well together. So plant for diversity and insect foraging throughout the season. Think in terms of layers. There's the soil layer, the litter layer, and then leaves and stems. And that might be an herbaceous ground cover. Um, Ursanga recommended that I um, point, put some dwarf sink foil in. Uh, and that has become a wonderful base layer plant in, in the meadow at the Eagle Center in Prince William. And then there's the blossom layer. And that blossom layer may not give you a continuous bloom, but you can work toward having frequent blooms in that blossom layer. Now, you know, if you live in an HOA, you might need a more tidy. My, my meadow is not very tidy. It tends to be messy. Messier look is usually more diverse. It's more attractive to wildlife. I, I don't tidy it up. Uh, it's not tidy not now. There's a lot of stems that are in place for uh, native insects to overwinter in. But if you live in an HOA, you might select uh, something that looks more along the lines of Thomas Vernier, Larry Wiener, Pete Ondoff's designs, but choosing local ecotypes instead. It's a little, it's less diverse, less attractive to wildlife, but maybe more acceptable in an HOA. So here, here's um, my messy meadow. And um, it, uh, you have some spider warts right here and uh, the tallest purple. 
Um, and the spider warts get in my yard, get about five feet tall because they're trying to compete with all the other, other plants. And then I have Monarda fistulosa and some tall phlox and I have yarrow. Yarrow is a good base layer for me. I have Achillea mellifolium, the common yarrow and it's evergreen all uh, winter long. Here's some, here's a few others. I have, also have a ground layer of uh, Salvia Lorata, Lyre Leaf Sage, uh, and then the Blossom Layer, Coreopsis, and some more Yarrows sticking its head up. There's some Bachelor's Button thrown in there. They are not native. Culver's Root or, or uh, Verona Castrum and Heliopsis make the Blossom Layer. And then um, the Basil Leaves of Rigeron, the um, common flea bane, um, <laughs> It, it's a thug, but it, it does a good job of covering the soil and creating that base layer. Here's changes every week. Well, there's, and I threw in, okay, there's some non-native Siberian iris there, but they're, they're well-behaved. But I here you have Zizia in the background, the yellow streak across the back, uh, white or pink Erigeron, um, the Verona castrum and the Achillea millifolium. So you can see the, the layers a little bit here. Avoid planting these in your meadow. Um, these are all super, uh, super aggressive and invasive. So um, um, avoid these. You wanna avoid tropical milkweed also. It has been implicated in a, a sharing a protozoan parasite of, for monarch butterflies and it can create problems for the, um, it doesn't die back as well in the winter. So I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is tropical milkweed. It's very common at garden centers, Asclepius crevastica, avoid that. Um, and, and by the native uh, milkweed, uh, um, Asclepius tuberosa is a, is a better option. And, and it acts as an annual around here. So aim for about, you know, 70% sedges or grasses. Um, but again, there's, a lot of variety in the literature about that 20% to 70% is a pretty wide range. I added, I add some native grasses and they help to um, hold up some of the perennials and provide a, a cover when the perennials are dying back. So avoid cultivars. Uh, this cultivar down at the bottom right-hand corner is pink double delight and um, it is sterile. Um, it, Echinacea is not, um, a local ecotype, and but I, I included it in, in my meadow. Um, I'm not a complete purist, but Double Delight uh, planted right next to the normal, um, the straight species of echinacea. Um, the, the straight species will be covered with pollinators and the Double Delight will have no visitors at all. There's some more research I'm gonna point you to in a minute. Okay, well, this is, um, I wanna show you this. Um, these. The next two slides are two uh, different Joe Pye weeds. One is a cultivar and one is a straight species. And I'm gonna see if you can tell which is which. Oops, excuse me. Let's see if I can make this go. Okay. They're planted in the same yard right next to each other. Let's see if I can see this. Let me get this to go here. Okay, you can see that the cultivar is the first one. No visitors or very few visitors. And the, the one planted right next to it is covered with butterflies and other pollinators. So uh, I don't th I think Sam Droji might be in this session, but I'm gonna quote him here. He has a one hour mini meadow at his um, B lab in Maryland. Um, and I would urge you to, if, in uh, the next session to listen to what he has to say. Um, it, has, it has some annuals in it and some perennials waiting to leap in the fall. This is more of a messy style, but I, I like it. So let's look at, and that, these are some of the things that Sam suggests as aggressive spreaders. If, if you live in a pretty free <laughs> housing area, you can go a little wild. Heliopsis halicinoides, the false sunflower, 
it'll take over. Uh, cup plant, not specifically uh, native to uh, Northern Virginia, but is an aggressive spreader. Healing at the, uh, the Jerusalem artichoke, partridge pea, uh, and Monarda fistulosa. Those are all great aggressive spreaders if you want a quick, if you want quick coverage. So a little bit, little word about diversity of plants. Um, if you aren't seeing a wide variety of different pollinators and insects in your landscaping, it's time to maybe add more local plant diversity. Flowering plants have traits, of course, to attract specific pollinators and not all pollinators can use that same type of flowers. So alter the, alter the flowering time, the density of the flowers, the flower height and the spatial pattern. A pollinator's body size, strength, its tongue length to determine which plants it uses. So annuals versus perennials. As I said, all the seed mixes that you can buy commercially in box stores are mostly annuals and they're mostly not native. Um, if annuals are desired, you could sow. I, I was sowing partridge peas yesterday because I, I wanted to take advantage of um, being able to pack the soil well for good seed contact and the snow coming to give it some moisture. Per, and then they'll, they will wait in the ground and uh, sprout when, when the conditions are right. And that freeze and thaw cycle will help to break up that seed coat and prepare them to germinate. Perennials provide more consistent ground coverage, but uh, there are some annuals that I, I like to put in and partridge pea is one uh, that's locally native and it's a very reliable reseeder. Um, perennials may not flower right away, uh, especially if you have plugs. So here's the breakdown. Seeds are the least expensive, but prices are climbing. Uh, they're still not a cheap option. Uh, make sure you have the, you know, have the budget for the area that you choose to convert. Make sure it has good soil to seed contact and adequate moisture. It's hard to recognize seedlings at some. Some you can direct sow and some you can be winter sowing. And I'll, I'll have a slide on that in a minute. Landscape plugs, they're more susceptible to, uh, so to lack, lack of water. So you might need to monitor them a little closer. They're very easy for volunteer groups to plant because you only need to do a little divot hole and disturb the soil as little as possible. Of course, plants are the most expensive. They give you instant color and coverage. And the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. And, um, and you can get a really great variety of local ecotypes at Ursanga. So here's, here's a, um, this, this is a low grower and a high grower, the basil leaves of this fleabane uh, daisy. Um, this is an aggressive plant. Um, I have to edit it out uh, occasionally in my yard where it wants to take over and, and just dominate everything, but it, but it is reliable and it's beautiful and the pollinators love it. Go to the Plant Nova Natives website too to also select plants for the right community and for conditions in your yard. Hey, Here's Nancy. a few. Yeah. Sorry, uh, there's 10 minutes left of the presentation until the 10 minute Q&A. Okay, cool, thanks. Thank you. Okay, here's a few low growers, uh, pussy toes. This is the uh, native bleeding heart, uh, columbine and uh, coreopsis verticillata. Um, so we're going to go through these pictures and just kind of absorb them. You can always look at this later at any of these presentations. Here's a flu few more low growers, partial sun, some violets, uh, the, the common blue violet, <coughs> dog tooth violet. This is the, um, in the bottom left hand corner is the lyre leaf sage and packer aria is a excellent ground cover, um, low grower for uh, partial sun areas. Um, it is a little aggressive, but you know, in a good way. <laughs> um, here's some partial sun early summer plants, the geranium maculatum and the uh, columbine. Uh, some early midsummer uh, plants, so, so the two baptisias, tinctoria and australis. Uh, and the Rebecca, uh, Rebecca uh, fulgita and Rebecca herda great dependable plants will seed everywhere. I think they, are, they might be a good one to start with. And there, there's the orange butterfly weed, not the tropical, but the Asclepius tuberosa. 
Here's a few for full sun um, for for summer. You can they're tall, or you can put them on a trellis. The three liatrices, um, obedient plant, um, uh, and then um, Lanisfera sempervirens. Um, these are these are uh, good plants that bloom a little later in the season. Everybody should have a solidago goldenrod in your garden. Everybody should have an aster. I want the garden centers to stop selling mums and start selling only asters. But gold, they're both uh, magnets for um, beneficial insects, and um, you could you could spend all day watching those plants and all the visitors that come to them. Here's a. Uh, uh, Rebecca Triloba, another reliable spreader. Rubina Hastada, and here's a, here's a nice goldenrod, the wreath goldenrod. Here's a few for um, that like a little more shade. That lyre leaf sage, and this this lyre leaf sage had, retains its leaves all winter long and makes a really nice ground cover. Uh, this is Conoclinium coalescium, the bloom mist flower, reliable reseeder, and sedges. There's so many good native sedges that will you know, retain that moisture in the soil and hold the soil well. So this is something I've changed in my presentation. I used to recommend tall native grasses like switchgrass and Indian grass, the things that you see at the Manassas battlefield. But since that time, I've consulted with Bob Glennon from USDA, and he suggests that these may outcompete your perennials more often and that these uh, particular um, grasses that are a little smaller, shorter, would be a, a better option. So I'm going to give these a try based on his recommendations. Um, they can take a, a couple years to establish, but they do hold the soil really, really well. Okay. And they provide food and habitat all winter long too. So here's a list. You might want to take a little snap of some, some, um, some partial sun uh, grasses and forbs that you might wanna consider for your first round. <clears throat> Here's a few for shade that you might wanna consider. These are all re very reliable or partial sun. Oops, so uh, I wanna talk, uh, shoot, okay. So Mount Cuba Center has some good research on native ours at local garden centers, your native plant. We've been working with Plant Nova natives to put stickers at garden centers uh, to point out the natives so you can see them easily. But at Mount Cuba Center, if you want to read more about uh, what are favorable native ours, native ours are, are plants that um, are genetically slight slightly different than the straight species. Um, and so Echinacea purpurea is not native to Northern Virginia. And this species, again, is not attractive to pollinators. Uh, it's in fact, it's sterile. So read Mount Cuba Center's research reports to make sure that if you are picking a cultivar, that you're not picking one that, um, that, you, that you're picking one that has ecological value. Um, and so here's some pictures in, from, my, from my yard, from some of the pollinators. Uh, this is Mount Cuba's work on Coreopsis uh, varieties and all the different diverse insects that visit. Pretty impressive. Uh, Heather Holmes has a great book and a website on um, wasps. And the wasps are the most interesting uh, insects that I found. I, I plant a couple things. I plant that... Um, uh, bone set just to see the, the wasp with the bright blue wings. Uh, University has Kentucky has done some garden organization research for monarchs and the, the, the planting scheme right here with the arrow by it, uh, they found uh, 2.5 to four times more monarch eggs and larva with garden design A. And uh, the you can see that Asclepius uh, incarnata is on the perimeter of that. Winter sowing is an option for a cheaper way to get seeds started. There's a winter sowing Facebook page and Penn State has some great extension papers on it. So um, invest, you can investigate that in your free time. A little bit for maintenance. Growing a meadow is like any other type of garden. It does require some maintenance. 
you can't burn in the suburbs, um, but you can weed whack, mow and reseed. Um, I'm always scouting for weeds and woody vegetation to keep my meadow a meadow of native plants. The winter meadow is filled with interest. Uh, this is Pete Ondoff's picture and the seeds are filled with carbohydrates and protein. So leave the seed heads up all winter for beauty and for wildlife. Um, this is a, a picture from the uh, garden at Potomac Library. And um, this, this picture right here is uh, um, either a leaf cutter bee, no, this is a mason bee that, that got in the stem of one of my heliopsis. And this is of course the Asian praying mantis, various discussions on that elsewhere. Uh, to mow or not mow, um, I don't mow at all. Uh, I, I, I do do a little bit of clearing away when I put a new plant in. Hand pruners on small meadows can re remove diseased vegetation, but you don't have to be too meticulous. I would wait to mow until late September. You want to avoid um, any ground nesting birds or other wildlife. Scout for your weeds and invasives, especially the first and second years. You can cut them, cut the weeds off at the ground. Um, I put a nurse crop in, it wasn't highly effective, but that's a fast growing annual grass that you can put around to protect the area from weeds and then you can crimp it over uh, when, when the time comes for the plants to be um, emerging. So a few takeaways, the sign of a great gardener is expecting plants to be eaten. Uh, we're still educating our clients about that on a regular basis at Extension. If you can't commit to a meadow, maybe you can commit to uh, a hell strip with native plants or a hedgerow of native shrubs, or maybe the a little pocket meadow. This is one at the uh, Botanic Gardens designed by Thomas Frenier. He says that, uh, let me propose an alternative. Instead of limiting to lawn and the perennial border, let's take that border and explode it. Let's blanket our landscapes and convert our wall-to-wall -wall carpeting lawns into well-proportioned area rugs. I love it. And don't try to grow grass in difficult to most spots. Put, um, put native plants that like the wet shade in those areas. Okay, the Master Gardener Program. Here's our contact information if you want an Audubon at home visit for Prince William, Manassas City or Manassas Park. We do have some Zoom sessions coming up on, on our Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. Free classes, you can register it at the Prince William County website. And if you have a plant, insect, or wildlife question, Master Gardeners staff that desk um, on weekdays. And here's a few resources um, to, to consult. Ask your garden center to carry natives. Look for native stickers, courtesy of Plant Nova natives when you go to a garden center. Stay in touch. We're on social media with Extension and the Master Gardeners in Prince William. We'd love to interact with you on there. And a few resources, and you'll be able to watch this presentation again. I know it was an awful lot of information, but um, I hope this just whets your appetite. A few more resources. This is this Instagram account is, account is um, Sam Droji's fantastic photography. I recommend it. And there's the way that you get into my front door. My six foot nine son hates it because he can't get in without bending over. <laughs> so I'm open for questions now. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. I know everyone's excited to get their meadow started now. Um, so you do have a lot of great questions. If you wouldn't mind going back to the, the list of um, the, you had the partial shade grasses and forbs. Uh, so people I know can this is fast, guys. Yeah, yeah. I know it's frustrating. <laughs> yes, thank you. Oops. Okay, yeah, so those. That one? Yes, yeah, so I think people wanted to uh, take a minute yeah, to take, that. get a screenshot of that. Um, so our first question uh, from Mark, he is looking to plant a meadow into some stormwater areas. If you don't want to smother the turf grass, can you just plant in plugs and will it spread naturally or will it not compete with the turf grass? It won't, it won't compete well with turf, turf grass. Um, and I mean, it depends on how dense you put the plugs in too. Um, 
And is the stormwater on your property or is it a, is it part of the HOA? Cause, cause you do need some um, permission to do that. I believe he said he's the president of his HOA, which is great. Okay. You know what, um, if, if you're in Prince William County, we can do a site visit with you. And that that's what we do. We usually do it on Friday mornings or Friday afternoons. So if you want to contact the master gardener desk, you can get in touch with us there with me there. He's in Loudon. Oh, Loudon. Uh, I would, I would talk with, um, they have an amb uh, Audubon ambassador program. I would talk with them. Okay, great. Thank you. And then Bernadette is wondering, do you know whether Fairfax County has a list for a native landscape plan? Um, you know, there, there is, um, there, there are some really great plans online. I'm, I'm with Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals. And uh, I just saw, I think it's called the Green Book or the Blue Book. Anyway, Bernadette, uh, e email me through the Master Gardener desk, or I'm available at nberlin at vt.edu, uh, vt for Virginia Tech, nberlin at vt.edu. And I can um, send you some resources for that. But you know that compendium that Matt has uh, posted on uh, Ursanga's website is also a fantastic resource yeah, once you great. determine the plant community. Yeah. Um, and could you go to the resources page so people yep. can do a screenshot? Okay, thank you. And Stephanie is wondering, how do you remove competing vegetation without disturbing the soil? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, you can scalp it um, and, or you can sod cut it. You're gonna disturb the soil some. Mm -hmm. This one. Um, there, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's a good YouTube on that. Um, there's a couple suburban and urban meadows. It's in most libraries. They have some good diagrams in there. Matt, are you in here? Yes, I'm here. What, any suggestions? You're the, you're the <laughs> one I go to to ask. <laughs> I would say one of the, the concerns, right, with, with soil disturbances, you know, th this is part of the reason why we talk about that we want to preserve what we have first, right? Because right. when we go in to restore an area, you're, you're going to have to crack, uh, to crack some eggs to, to make that, that omelet. Yeah. I, I think to that point, you know, some of the, 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 the solarization isn't going to alter the structure of the soil so much, though obviously it is uh, going to kill a lot of the biological components of, yeah. of the soil. Um, what I've done before is just bought flooring paper uh, from Home Depot, um, you know, or, or any hardware store. It's just untreated craft paper. There's no plasticky elements. And then use mulch so you can use like a chip drop service. Um, that photo that was in my presentation at Windmill Hill Park um, that wasn't, it wasn't a chip drop, but they had invasives that, uh, trees that they chipped there and just spread that out, um, and let that sit. And then we planted right into it. And that, that did a very fantastic job of suppressing a lot of the invasives and we didn't have to go in and do any tilling or any, any sort of removal like that. Yeah. So oftentimes like a one-time heavy mulch treatment could, could work. And build your soil at the same time. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Um, Dale asked, what is the best way to keep grass slash weeds out of an established meadow plot? <laughs> Dense planting, <laughs> um, you know, and choosing, choosing plants that will establish that base layer of vegetation, you know. Yeah, so Dale also said he has a small sunny meadow area that can be wet. Um, I believe he has milkweed, Siberian iris, and coneflower, and he's wondering what else would be good. Yeah, the Siberian iris are going to take over everything, um, <laughs> so you might want to reconsider that. I, I'm going to probably remove mine. They were here, and, and they're they're a bear to get out. Um, so let's go back to this uh, list here. And remember, think about the plant community too, because. Um, you know, the ref, you know, look for a reference community. What's growing, uh, what's growing 
in an adjacent um, area? And, and what plant community? Is it a floodplain? Is it a music forest? Uh, any of these would be um, appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so we just have a few more minutes and then we'll have um, a 25 minute break. Uh, so Pamela asked, do you worry about disease being brought in with arborist mulch? Maybe that tree was cut down for a reason. No, I, I don't. It's chipped. It's chipped pretty small. I, it depends, you know, certainly depends on the arborist, but no, no, I don't bring, I, I don't worry about that. Okay, that's good. Uh, Julie says, Clematis virginiana has taken over my one-third acre meadow. I would like to get rid of it. Should I? Um, it, it, my, my gut feeling is it might be sweet autumn clematis. Um, that came into mind. It's really distributed well by birds. And that's an invasive clematis. And it looks very much like um, the, the native clematis. So... The native clematis is not, not as aggressive. It's not very aggressive at all. In fact, I've had to baby it a little bit uh, on a trellis, but uh, go to a good plant ID uh, website and uh, compare uh, sweet autumn clematis, which is the invasive to the, to the native uh, Virginiana. Okay. My, my gut feeling is that's what you've got, the invasive. Okay. Um... And oh, Jean asked, what about burning a spot to establish an area for a meadow? I, I'm not an expert on control burn at all. I know it, it can be effective, um, but it's not. Matt, do you have an opinion on that? Depends yeah, I on think, where you live too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're gonna do a great big controlled burn, there's all sorts of permitting and timing things. You know, if you're just talking about using one of those kind of propane kind of little torches to scorch out uh, some weeds, I, I think that could be effective. Um, you know, when we've worked with uh, Fairfax County Park Authority with, with some of their meadows where they are managing by burns, um, they've seen a lot of, of, of shifts in, in those plant communities, some really good. Sometimes they flush out some invasives that they, they weren't looking uh, to have in there. Um, I would do a little plug for uh, Owen uh, Williams is an ecologist with Fairfax County Park Authority. He also consults about meadow establishment. Um, he helps manage uh, Fairfax County Park Authority's kind of burn program. Um, so, you know, folks that are that are interested, if you get in, in touch with, with me or the um, uh, the the organizers uh, for for this, I can provide his his contact information um, or, you know, this might be a question for for John Burke, who is Owen's boss, uh, who is doing a breakout se session today, too. And obviously, you're knowledgeable about that kind of stuff, too. Great. Thanks. OK, so. Um... We are at the end. Uh, we have a scheduled break before the next breakout session. Uh, so I apologize if we didn't get to everyone's question, but Nancy, you're okay with folks emailing you? Sure. Um, in Berlin at bt.edu, which I can type again in the chat box. Um, but yeah, well, thank you so much everyone for being here and we will see you back at 1130. And hope you all have a good break. Septic. Missed that one. Okay.